SoCal Connected is made possible through the generous support of the Amundsen Foundation, serving the Los Angeles community since 1952. On tonight's SoCal Connected. No benefits to speak of, no vacation typically, no retirement security. They're really floating out there on their own. It's already happening to some people. Security guards, retail, restaurants, chefs, bartenders, construction workers. Welcome to the future of work. You can build your own future with your bare hands. The artist who turned his work into an agent of change. You teach them how to, create, to add value to making something. Hello, I'm Val Zavala. We are witnessing the rise of the super temp. Freelancers and part-timers, wages are often low with no benefits. So what happens if or when we become a nation of gig workers? Here's our report on the future of work and what it may mean for you. I have been without a steady job for now for almost two years. Went to university, got my degrees, went to private school, got a master's, got a teaching certificate. And after all these years, here I am driving for less than minimum wage. Fifty-six-year-old Ruben Gonzalez was a teacher at a local school district. I thought I would have picked something up right away and uh, I'd be right back at it. He used to be middle class. There's nothing wrong with driving for Uber, but it's, if it's, that's what you want to do, that's fine. Okay. I never did want to do this. The thought of uh, just picking up strangers. And... Thank you. Okay, get some rest. Sure. I apply for a lot of jobs and a lot of jobs are contracting and commission and go through training and it's going to take a few weeks. Well, I can't afford to go a few weeks. I can't afford to go a few days. This is the future of work for tens of millions of Americans. It's the rise of the gig worker. There's definitely been a trend and it has accelerated dramatically in the last 10 years or so toward what is often referred to as contingent work. Contingent workers freelancers, gig workers, temps, independent contractors, consultants, and sometimes even entrepreneurs. A lot of times entrepreneur is a fancy word for saying you're a low-wage worker for a company and, and it's saving us money. From cooks to film crews to doctors, freelancers are everywhere. We're talking 34% expected to rise to 43% by the year 2020. We don't see it. It's almost invisible. According to a 2016 Princeton study, all of the net job growth from 2005 to 2015 was in the contingent economy. America is becoming a nation of gig workers. It's interesting to hear where the word gig, most people don't even know where the word gig, it's, it's musicians and gigs, it is. People who have a one night uh, performance, but we're talking about gig economy employees, laborers who basically are low paid and where the demands are huge. It's the day laborization of our economy. They show up to work for the chance to work. Their paycheck is from day to day or even job to job. And there's no security, there's no stability, there's no longevity, there's no commitment to the worker. I think it's companies trying to shift uh, the burden of the economic risk to, to workers. You know, companies no longer have to provide health benefits. They no longer have to invest in that individual's retirement. They no longer have to uh, do what traditional uh, employers used to do. So how did we get here? For starters, 
union membership has been declining for decades. Wages have been stagnant for 40 years and pensions are disappearing. It used to be in the 50s and 60s, a very small fraction of CEO compensation was based uh, on their company share price. Now, depending on how you measure it, it's anywhere from 50 to 80 percent. In turn, it makes it in their interest to try and drive up that stock price. So how do you do that in the short term? What's the quickest way to make your company's stock go up? The quickest way is to cut costs. And you begin to look at your employees not as assets that you invest in. You look at them as costs and you cut them. And for those you do keep, you convert them from employees to independent contractors. Gonzalez pays all of his costs, gas, insurance, car repairs, parking tickets, because he's classified as an independent contractor. He's paid as if he is a company, not an employee. Costs that businesses usually pay for are now shifting to the worker. I've heard other drivers who are driving, they hit potholes and they, their axle went up. It was $700. I mean, if that were happened to me, I don't know where I would get $700 from. And it wouldn't, not, it wouldn't just be their the cost of replacement, but the time the car is being repaired, I'm losing money there too. I have to repair my sun visor because from using it so much, it came off. If they are independent contractors, uh, they really have no benefits to speak of. They have no vacation typically, uh, they certainly have no retirement security, uh, they don't have employer provided health care typically. They're really floating out there on their own. I do this seven days a week. The entire month, I, don't, I, I can't afford to take any days off. No sick pay. No unemployment insurance. No workers' compensation. No safety nets. This is where I'm at now. I don't know what I'm going to do once my kids grow up and how I'm going to survive when I retire. I have to move to another country because I can't afford to live here. It's an extremely vulnerable position for workers to be in because now if they're retaliated against for standing for their rights, there's no protection for it. If they are injured on the job, there's no protection for it. All of the cost, the expenses of doing the work falls on the worker. I'm just one major car breakdown or a health issue away from to being homeless. Uh, and that scares me. These working people now, they're not entitled to health insurance, so they, are, they, they, they end up going to the emergency room instead of seeing the doctor regularly. They don't get any kind of unemployment benefits, and so there's no payroll taxes being paid. So the rest of us pay for that, and the employer is getting labor on the cheap. And some companies are doing it illegally. According to state data, anywhere from 10 to 20 percent of employers misclassify their workers as independent contractors. It's wage theft, and Sue is seeing it in all kinds of professions. We've seen this in security guards, retail, restaurants, chefs, bartenders, construction workers, and in the entertainment industry. We're being treated like employees, but we are paid as independent contractors. I've been an independent contractor as an extra, as a writer, as an actor, as a stuntman, as a PA, as a story producer, as a field producer, as a DGA director. All of those jobs, you're an independent contractor. In decades past, labor unions fought these battles. And with their erosion, workers are increasingly on their own. The Hollywood Reporter recently paid a million dollars to some former writers who were classified as independent contractors. And Uber drivers in several states are suing the corporation, claiming they should be treated as employees. 700 truck drivers at the port of LA have made wage claims with Sue's office saying they are misclassified. It takes drivers until each week, they get paid each week, and it could take them until Wednesday or even Thursday before they even begin to make $100. And the reason for that is because the company charges them to use the company truck. They charge them to maintain the company truck, to buy new tires. They even charge these guys to park the company truck at the company yard overnight. They, don't, they can't even take it home. This kind of misclassification has led to an extreme destabilization of many, many industries, and in fact, of the entire workforce. 
This misclassification of drivers at the port is a good example of how it gobbles up an entire industry. Once everyone starts doing it to stay competitive, it's a race to the bottom. And the workers aren't alone at the bottom. The state of California is losing too, about $7 billion a year in payroll taxes. That means there's less money being paid into programs like Social Security and Medicaid, programs workers are increasingly relying on. So who's winning? TopTal, Upwork, CodeMentor, companies who specialize in outsourcing workers. It can feel like the end of loyalty. The social contract has largely gone out the window, and with that, loyalty on both sides has, has gone out the window. It's not through any fault of the workers. We've done everything right. We've been loyal to the companies. We showed up on time. For mainly, I would think, for financial reasons, cost saving or trying to please shareholders. Our options are being eliminated. It's scary. Not only have we pulled the security rug from under our employees, but we have broken down any sense of solidarity with other workers. The Uber driver is, is perhaps the best example of that. They drive around, they're alone. There's very little communication with others. In 1,000 feet, turn left onto Alamitos Avenue. It is a very lonely existence. My son has a difficult time being alone especially on, on the weekends. Um, so it's, it's difficult, and I miss it too. You know, there are events we don't go to. There are a lot of things we don't do. We used to hang out a lot at the, down by the piers or just walk around and go to events. We don't do that anymore. And he mentions that. Um, and even if I drive and I get off early, at, if I start on the weekends and early in the morning at, at you know, this time, the morning, 5.30 or 6, and I'll drive till 2 or 3 and, and I get home, it's, you know, I'm tired. And then I end up going to bed early because I get up early. So those are things that I really miss and it's, it's affecting him. Things could be worse, but... You know, right now, my only concern is my kids. I don't even care at this point what happens to me. I'm just trying to get them to adulthood. It's been years since he had a job with health insurance. The last time that I went to a dentist, 11, 12 years ago. The last time I had a, a physical, it was probably about, gosh, seven, eight years ago. I mean, if I have to make a choice of uh, paying a hundred dollars or something, whatever, to go see a dentist. Okay, go and go see if it's okay. I look at it as, that's a couple pairs of shoes for my kids. And so I defer the dentist. I guess the comforting thing is my family is very supportive and when we come up with the funds that we need, we it's like we won a game or a Super Bowl, we start cheering and throwing our hands, yeah, we got it, we got another month. And we collect it and we get a, there's a big sigh, then the, it starts again the next day. Ruben's wife just got a job at a 7-Eleven. Well, for us, this has been good because uh, when things are outdated and they get rid of them. She's been able to bring some sandwiches home and, and things like that. And then the kids get tired of them, but <laughs> that stuff is not healthy because some of the things that we eat, but it's something. I mean, it's either that or go hungry. So, so oftentimes what I do is I'll eat that food so I leave everything else for them. Millions of other workers are also struggling and their job options are shrinking. The type of jobs that were lost during the Great Recession are jobs that will not be coming back. We are just, as a society, unprepared. We are also seeing a disinvestment in education. In this country today, fewer than half of all adults have any kind of uh, credential post high school. 
So not a four-year college degree, not a two-year college degree. Those are the folks being left behind. Degree or not, what will workers do as their jobs are eliminated by technology and globalization? We need to begin to teach young people uh, the concept of lifelong learning, that once they're done school, that learning doesn't stop, it can't stop, um, that all of us need to refresh our skills and knowledge constantly through our entire lives. That is what uh, our society and our economy is going to demand if you're going to make it. But there are millions of Rubens out there who can't afford to go back to school, and they're scraping by in the midst of soaring inequality. We haven't seen this kind of income inequality in America since the 1920s, before the Great Depression, right? We are at those kinds of heights now. But a lot of this comes down again to that employment contract, that relationship between employer and employee. The income that I'm making to be considered a good job in middle class, it would be if I was living in a third world country. Uh, but not here, because it's, it's just, it don't make enough. It's just, it's very low pay. The gig is taking its toll. He's gaining weight. His legs and back hurt from driving so much. But he can't stop. Like for Thanksgiving, we didn't, I didn't have enough. We didn't have some of the things for the food, so I had to get up at five in the morning to drive at least five, six hours so we could complete our meal. At the end of this day, Reuben makes about $65 after expenses. That was for about seven hours of driving. I'll be out the rest of the week. I'll go back out uh, tomorrow again. I'll hit it again at 5, 5.30 in the morning each day. He's coming home early tomorrow. He has to pick up a suit from the dry cleaners. He's got a job interview for a position he's been eyeing for a year. I had my hair cut yesterday. Of course, I can't go to a barber, can't afford it, so I sit out here and my wife just chops it off. My one suit that I have. I mean, if I can nail the interview, I mean, I'll get another one later on. I'm just, I just need one. My wife told me not to mention it to the kids, but I said, let's give them a little bit of excitement. If I don't get it, at least they'll be excited for a week or two about the possibility, then none at all. So they know and they're, they're, uh, we're all eager to see what happens. But it's tomorrow and uh, I'm looking forward to it. Two weeks later, Ruben was informed he did not get the job. He's hoping another position opens up. Until then, he's back behind the wheel. You're about to meet a businessman who hires low-skilled workers. Why? Because he used to be one himself. His is an American success story that began in Mexico. There's something very genuine of when you have pride in what you do because then the value that you create it has no boundaries. I'm an Angelino. So this is what Made in LA looks like. This is what Made in LA looks like. And Cisco Pinedo is the living embodiment of a slogan he's made famous in Los Angeles. I was made in Mexico, and <laughs> uh, oh, half cook in Mexico, and I was, you know, finally baked here in LA. Pinedo is the founder and CEO of Cisco Home a furniture and home decor company he started nearly 30 years ago in his South Central garage. Pinedo's custom-made pieces are not only designed by him, every chair, every table, all the fixtures are handmade by craftspeople in Los Angeles. South Central, to be exact. Pinedo started as a furniture apprentice, tearing upholstery at 14, and quickly turned a furniture making on the side. Before I knew it, I was selling it to a designer, and then after that, the designer was selling it to a big Hollywood star, and all of a sudden, you know, the word was out that there was this amazing craftsman in South Central. Tourists converge on his Melrose Avenue store daily. Pinedo's slogan is one of the most Instagram walls in L.A. But the real showmanship is on the other side of the wall, like recycling every type of material that comes his way. This textiles in particular are from Guatemala. So they're um, women's skirts, and okay. we literally, you know, <laughs> just pick skirts from them. 
Pinedo's Latin heritage is woven into many of his pieces. Coming from Mexico with his migrant worker father in the 1970s, Pinedo says he was undocumented and always welcomed by the farm families who hired them. But when the whole family moved to South Central, it was a culture shock. There was a lot of conflicts between, you know, especially Mexicans and African Americans. So my mom didn't want me to be in the streets too much. So, she, you know, she says, you had to find a part-time job or something. <laughs> she put you to work. <laughs> she yeah. put me to work. So I found this little, um, you know, um, furniture shop. And I kind of fell in love with the, with the craft uh, right out of the bat. It's just, it was something very magical, making something with your bare hands. We visited the South Central neighborhood where Pinedo grew up and where he now employs the various craftspeople who make his products. From glass blowers to carpenters, to metal workers, to upholsterers. How important is it to, to remain in South Central? I, you know, it's part of who I am. I mean, I don't know if I can change that, you know, it's just, I tell people, I, you know, I live in, I, I sleep in Pasadena and I live in South Central, so. <laughs> <laughs> His workers tell us Pinedo makes them aspire to have more in life. They're taught skills and given opportunities to not simply labor, but create careers. Here in upholstery production, Jose Galvez went from sweeping floors to managing a hundred craftspeople. Out of all your employees, how many came like unskilled and now are working machines? God, I don't know, probably 60, 70 percent. Oh, wow, yeah. most of them. Yeah. My hope is that we can inspire people to become self-sustained in their own life with their own, their own means. But we end up with amazing people, you know, they end up in uh, building great careers, you know, as makers. Pinedo says that's his life's mission, and he embodies it. Hard work coupled with imagination to craft a life. It's how he crafts every new collection as well. And I work with the craftsmen, and we kind of start molding what I, my vision is of a new design, and then we take it to the design team once it's finished. Okay, so you, you will hand make a prototype yourself and then give it to a design team to digitize it, basically. To digitize it and record it and to have in our files and to be able to use that information for the rest of the team. I know, it's totally backwards. Yeah. <laughs> in the metal shop that makes lamps, mirrors, and table frames from recycled materials, inspiration comes from anything and everything. Those are dryers. Dryers, yeah. Okay. So, and we make lights out of them. So literally people shows up and sometimes they come in a truck and they just go, hey, we need to get rid of this. We're gonna take it to the dumpster. And they, we are the stop before they go to the dumpster. <laughs> so where else do you source all your stuff? Construction sites, uh, people that are doing demolition, uh, movie sets. Chili pepper, right? Even if that raw material <laughs> takes the form of a giant thing? chili pepper. You know, literally one day we show up in the morning and when it was little left by the gate. Somebody just left it there. So I still haven't figured out what to do with it, so don't ask me. Oh, okay, okay. So, but there's a plan somewhere. The, oh, we, will, we will come up with something. Maybe we open a taco truck and we put it on top of it. I love it already, man. Like others, Pinedo has moved into entrepreneurship. The metal shop is owned by Conan Carrillo, Pinedo's former maintenance worker. Five, six years ago, he, t he told me he said, I wanted to be on my own. He, he was gonna give me the chance to be on my own. And like, I was waiting for that opportunity, and here we are. You came here as an undocumented worker yourself. Why is it so important to, for others to get into entrepreneurship? If I can do it, anybody else can do it. We don't have to be like on the streets, like asking for money. We, we, if we came to work, if we get ourselves to focus and be working, I think we can get results. We're trying to prepare them like that. They can start their own business if they want to. How do you feel about your role in providing these kinds of opportunities to immigrants? Well, I feel like the opportunity was given to me. So I, I, to me, it's very, it comes very natural. I feel like we all deserve that and we all should have that opportunity. So I don't, it's not that I take it for granted, but I feel like it's the right thing to do. Giving back for Pinedo has extended beyond his factories. He co-founded a foundation that teaches ex-felons in Brooklyn entrepreneurship through making reclaimed furniture and starting their own businesses. The whole point is to teach them how to, to add value to making something. 
you know, I think I have put uh, maybe about 11, 12 people to the program. And, you know, if you combine them all, they employ now about 120 people. Pinedo started a foundation to provide scholarships and support to LA's college-bound Latino students. The current debate around the status of DREAMers and the expiration of DACA has made him an activist. As a high school dropout who came here undocumented, these kids bring out the fighter in him. People coming out of Mexico or Latin America, the situation in those countries is so horrific that at the end of the day, you know, people are going to do whatever they need to do for what's the best for their families. And if you're in their shoes, being illegal in this country, it's not a bad place to be if you compare it to the place that you come from. Do you think people should be following the law if they don't have a visa that they shouldn't be allowed in? Well, of course people should be following the law. But their situation in this country is so bad that they'd rather survive and they'd rather put food on their table of their kids and take that chance. Is entrepreneurship a way out? Absolutely. I think it's a ticket to everything. You can deny someone being legal. And you can deny someone, you know, keeping them um, food or, you know, helping the homeless on the street. But um, when you create a craft for yourself, nobody can take that away from you. And you can take that anywhere. And you can build your own future with your bare hands. You can make your own future. Yeah. And I think that's, to me, it's the answer to everything. And that's our program for tonight. Don't forget you can see all of our stories online at our website, SoCalConnected.org. I'm Val Zavala. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.